Welcome back to NatSec 2020, Coronavirus and Beyond. As COVID disrupts everyday life, it creates a long list of new challenges for the military. Readiness and well-being of the enlisted force is on that list. Let's learn more now about some of the many adjustments naval leaders have to make. Here with more, McPon Russell Smith, Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, Sergeant Major Troy Black, Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, and Mike Stevens, Executive Director of the Navy League. Gentlemen, thanks all very much for joining me. Sergeant Major Black, I want to start with you. What are the top three concerns for the well-being and the readiness of your enlisted personnel in light of what we've seen over the last couple of months with COVID? Even if it doesn't have to do with COVID, what are your big three right now, sir? Well, I think first and foremost, I, I'm going to I'm going to give you four. I think the one's obvious to everybody. It's the safety and security of the force uh, and their families. I think that's a given. Specific to the Marines, um, we're, we're consistently concerned right now with our accession process. Being able to maintain our accessions, with up training, in preparation for deployment. That's the military side of it. Family side of it is if they concern and support to our families during this time, Marines are still training, Marines are still deploying. So how COVID's impacted our support to families is a top concern of the Marine Corps at large. A wise officer told me once, sir, when a Marine wants to give you four instead of three, you let him do it. Good point. Now, I'd say for the Navy, um, I, I think that we uh, we also have to keep our, our accessions uh, coming in. Uh, uh, that that supply chain of sailors moving their way from citizen to sailor and out to the fleet has to continue. We can't take a knee even for a little bit because our competitors out there in the world are going to take a knee, and we have to continue to man ships and be prepared to fight. So managing to do that some way uh, in a way that's healthy is absolutely essential to to what we do uh, because of the unique operating environment of the Navy on ships and submarines and other tight confined spaces. Uh, we're getting that that distancing isn't really feasible or make a lot of sense. Um, testing is really, really going to be essential. Short of a vaccine, testing for us is really going to be the long pull in the tent. Um, accurate testing, timely testing is the long pull that keeps us operational um, and really cuts down on, on lag time as we try to, we use nature and ROM uh, to help us make sure that our crews are safe. Testing gets us there faster. It makes us more agile and flexible. Mike, is it your sense that those priorities are changing as a result of COVID? I mean, I imagine safety and security of uh, sailors and Marines has been a huge priority all through the history of both forces. That's probably not changed. Do some of the individual things that you're hearing there change? And what's your sense of how they change back in a, uh, a post-COVID environment, whatever that looks like? You know, I, I would echo what both Sergeant Major Black and Mick Vaughn Smith has said that First and foremost, it's about the safety of all of our service members. Uh, the one thing that we're confident in is both the Navy and the Marine Corps' ability to adjust to whatever the situation is uh, to ensure that that safety uh, remains in place. Um, I know that both services have had to adjust very quickly on how they train, uh, how they bring people in, making sure that uh, they're safe while they're in their training uh, without disrupting that pipeline that Mick Palm Smith said. I mean, just watching from afar, it's been really impressive to see the speed in which both services have reacted to this situation. And I'm confident and sure as we all are that they'll continue to do so. That a, a session, uh, both of you mentioned, gentlemen, the, the accession issue and how you keep that supply chain flowing. What does that continue to look like moving forward? Are some of the changes that you've made as a result of COVID changes that are likely to stick? Uh, Sergeant Major Black, why don't you go first? Yeah, I would say potentially, and not to get too deep into the weeds of, you know, the recruit training uh, environment, but, you know, once you bring a collection of individuals from parts unknown into the recruit training environment, they start to interact with each other, colds, flus, you name the, name the virus or, or contagion that, that occurs inside that training environment. Most things happen no matter whether we're in COVID or not. So some of the lessons we're learning with ROM, uh, that's that that's that 14 day period before we begin training. Some of those things may find their, their way into the, the normal training environment post COVID. There's been a benefit to that. I'd also say how we are processing through the recruiting stations, the MEPS, which affects all the services, 
the, the additional testings we're going to do there. I think once we figure out what a greater testing uh, atmosphere looks like at the MEPS, we're probably going to find a lot more things showing up, you know, COVID, whatever's after COVID. We have a better ability to do that and then process those individuals onto their recruit training uh, 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 pipelines. Mick Pond Smith, do you see things, uh, some of the changes that you've made uh, as a result of this sticking? So I, I, I think we knew going in that we were going to find some, um, some better practices, some efficiencies, absolutely, with the way we do business. Um, I don't think that, you know, 14 days ROM and, you know, we're about to move to a, to a military facility. We've been using uh, a hotel facility up in Great Lakes. We're about to go to a, a military facility going forward, but um, that won't be the enduring thing most likely that we do. But, you know, from a, a standpoint of hygiene, like uh, Sergeant Major said, for us, we've had less cases of pneumonia and severe flu and, and hospitalization needs than we've ever had right now, even in COVID, um, partially because of the way we have, we've handled people and the way we've prevented that inner exchange of, of uh of colds and, and things that all happen when so many people from so many disparate parts of the country all come together and start sharing their germs. So the way we sort of handle things from a hygiene perspective and some other efficiencies that we've certainly learned in this, uh, in this process of bringing folks in, I, I think will probably stick. Um, and that's sort of the, the COVID writ large for us as a Navy. I think we've absolutely learned some things that we stopped doing because of COVID that we probably won't start doing again. Um, some things we'll have to go right back to doing as soon as we can, but there are some things that we've learned um, by not having to do them for a while that maybe as a point of, as a, of efficiency, and we probably don't need to go back to doing that. Mike, how would you advise enlisted personnel throughout both the Navy and Marine Corps to evaluate those things that have changed, whether they are things that should uh, stay or whether they're things that can, can or should or need to go back to the processes that the forces followed beforehand? Well, I, you know, I don't want to uh, overuse this cliche, but we've heard this throughout this COVID situation is where there is challenge, there's opportunity. And what I've seen both in the private sector and in DOD is taking this challenge and looking for these new opportunities. And primarily where we really capitalize on these opportunities are in the areas of technology. Um, and I think those things are gonna stick. We've learned how to work efficiently from places other than our normal areas of duty or work. Uh, the technology that we're using now is technology that we probably would have slow rolled in, in times gone by. Uh, I know that it's forced us at the Navy League to completely revisit uh, how we do business from a remote position. And I think we're much more effective at it than we, than we thought that, we, that we would be. And I would suspect that our partners at DOD are feeling the same way that how can we now take these uh, new technologies or this technology that's existed, but yet then implement it in ways that are gonna help us to function more efficiency, more efficiently and from remote and different locations. Mick Pond Smith, uh, Mike uses the term opportunity. I shouldn't probably be surprised uh, by the number of people both in the national security community and across the government enterprise that are using the word opportunity to describe what's going on here as the response to COVID. What's the opportunity that you see to do things differently, to either force change that you'd already started or to introduce new change into the system to reform something that you've wanted to reform or to change something that you've wanted to change, sir? Well, not surprisingly, uh what Big Pond Stevens just said is exactly what I find um, to be the greatest opportunity in front of us is we're an expeditionary service. The Navy and the Marine Corps both are, but for the Navy to be an expeditionary service, and when we immediately moved to nearly everyone teleworking, uh, we found out just how uh, how much our, our, our basic services lack the agility that they require for us to disaggregate and work remotely. Um, we have to be able to do that far better than we do today. And a lot of these, um, these forced processes made us catch up quickly. Um, moving to use, and I don't wanna mention the names of them, um, but finding platforms to communicate in a more robust way, um, doing conferences like this where some people can do this from home just as seamlessly as they can do it from the office. 
Um, that had to evolve, and this sort of threw gas on that fire. Sergeant Major Black, do you see opportunity here to drive change or to push things that you had already started, just hit the accelerator on them? Um, yes, I think, and on what, what Mick Pond said, I think we found out just how well we can communicate. Uh, we, we probably will find that there's going to be a terminal benefit just in communications. However, on the people side, I think what we're finding out is that, that how we understand humans in the process of either a session or training or, or beyond that, you got to focus on people now and their health and safety almost as much as you, we think about equipment. You know, Navy Marine Corps piece of equipment has a very dedicated process to make sure it's maintained, it's ready, it goes through different processes, and it doesn't fly or, or float or shoot until it does those things. Uh, the human aspect of that is, hey, somebody's here to fly the thing, shoot the thing, or drive the thing, then we're good. But COVID kind of put a damper in that because if you're infected with something, you can't go drive, fly, or shoot the thing. So we're thinking a little bit more about human performance, how we look at evaluating individuals for readiness, and much the same way we really look at how we evaluate gear and equipment for readiness. It either is or isn't. And if it's not, halfway there is not good enough. So I think we're going to see some benefits to how we take care of the force, uh, mind, body, and spirit, but really medically, how we train a little bit differently. I think those things will go, uh, go a little bit more on hyperspeed now. Sergeant Major, are you evaluating, are you seeing different results as to what you need, the capabilities that you need your Marines to do as a result of COVID? Or has that stayed pretty consistent? And what are those greatest areas of need? What do you need Marines to do most right now that you don't have enough of? Don't have enough of uh, testing immediately, and not just a COVID test. The same machinery or the same the same technology that's needed to test for COVID is multi-use. It does more than one thing. Just depends upon what you ask that technology to do. Without getting into the details of it, so having those sorts of technologies on hand at this place that they're needed and that way high up in the food chain where they're less accessible, I think we're going to find out that's important. And I use ships for an example. Imagine being able to test aboard a vessel uh, continually. Marines, sailors coming on and off of that ship, being able to immediately put them through a process and know, are they, do they have some sort of contagion or virus? Hugely important. That's one thing. I think the other thing we're going to terminally find out is, is that, you know, I'll make a joke of it, but uh, tactically, we have no problem people staying uh, five years apart anymore because six feet's kind of driven us to being able to, to separate uh, for, for training. So that's a benefit. I say that off the cuff, but no problem separating people anymore. That's a lot easier now. It's, it's second nature. Uh, Mick Ponton, what do you need capability-wise or force-wise moving forward to be able to build, to continue to mold, evolve uh, the Navy personnel into what you need them to execute mission? Well, I think in this COVID environment, I don't think I could said it, have said it any better than, than Sergeant Major did. Uh, we're in the same boat, testing rapidly, accurately, and along the lines of what he said, you know, today's fight is COVID. We have this bad habit of always fighting the last fight instead of the next one. Um, something that can just um, answer whatever it is we need to test for, not test for one specific thing. Um, having the kind of equipment that allows us to do this sort of medical analysis at, at, a, at a level far below where we do it today. Um, obviously with the need comes some specific requirements, but having that, that capability to test for things like this far lower than perhaps we have had in the past is definitely gonna be a thing going forward. Mike, to that point of fighting the next fight, what would you like to see leadership in the services or leadership in Congress or further up in OSD thinking about, talking about to prepare enlisted personnel to fight the next fight, whether it's fighting an adversary like COVID or fighting uh, in the context of the national defense strategy or some other way, what's the next fight? What, what do you think enlisted personnel need to prep best for whatever the next fight may be? Well, how that's done within the service, uh, I would leave that to the services themselves for sure, because that's their area of expertise. Uh, but what we do here at the Navy League and what we will continue to do is advocate for the resources that are necessary for them to operate at the highest level possible. Uh, we have the best people in the world, we already know that, but we have a responsibility to make sure that our people have the things that they need to be able to execute mission at the level that we know they're capable of. 
So just ensuring that they have the resources that are necessary for them to execute uh, is what I think is most important, at least from the position uh, of the from the position of the Navy League and from the responsibilities that we have. What do you see your how do you see your forces looking different as a result of COVID or not? Five years from now, ten years from now, what will your Marines and sailors be able to do that they don't do today? What will your force be able to do or do more of that it doesn't do or doesn't do as much of today? Give me a sense of of how your force looks different at those markers in the future. Sergeant Major, would you want you go first, please? I think we have the vans right now to be in what we would probably term the inner war years. And we're coming out of OIF, OEF, although we're still engaged globally in, in any number of, of activities, we have the ability right now to step back and take a look at what the enemy looks like in the future. Who are going to be, who are going to be those things we're, we're, we're challenged with? Uh, General Berger, when he came on deck, I offered his Commandant's planning guidance. We're currently going through the process of force design, shaping the Marine Corps for what it's going to look like 2030 and beyond. I think it's important that, that the Mick Pond and I are both here talking about this because the majority of what that looks like, it looks a more like a, a close relationship with the Navy and the Marine Corps. We don't need to get into why, how, if the reality of a separation whatever was, the Marine Corps was invested, OIF, OEF, the Navy was still having control of the seas. But now we find ourselves with an enemy and a fighting style that now requires the Navy and the Marine Corps be very closely associated and I'll let Mick Pond talk specifically to that, but distributed operations are how we're going to fight in the future. With technologies, more training, highly, more higher capable individuals, both at the officer and enlisted ranks, and being able to take the force writ large, the Navy and Marine Corps team, and now combat an enemy across a larger uh, footprint. I think, we're, I think that's the direction you're going to see us going, and that's already where the Marine Corps is going with its forces on it. So I, I think if you read the uh, I think if you read the national defense strategy, you can objectively come away with it understanding and <clears throat> feeling like it is a it's a predominantly maritime strategy that really focuses on the Navy Marine Corps team and what we do um, against the the near peer competitors that we expect to face uh, and the team um, the team operation that that we have to have and the the partnership that we have to um, again sort of refine and get really good at again is what we need to focus on so um covid not really having an influence on that long term looking at what the cno <clears throat> terms and talks about in future fleet and how that plays into our partnership with the marine corps um i don't think it looks any different than the than the strategy that the cno has laid out for the way he wants us to look um, i'm excited for for the future and and what it is that that we're going to be doing together with the Marine Corps to get ready for that next fight. I'll wrap up our coverage from day three of NATSEC 2020 coronavirus and beyond in just a moment. So keep it right here on GovMatters Conference TV. Mm -hmm.